Hello, and welcome back to the Coon Honey University Podcast. This is your host, Tyler Duncan, and like always, class is in session. Hey, before we get started, I'd like to say I'm sorry for the intro of my previous podcast. I don't know why it was as loud as it was. It shouldn't have been. Um, I did redo it, changed a little bit, and I definitely changed the noise on it. But um, I'm sorry, and I, I hope you enjoyed my new one a lot better than the last one. You couldn't enjoy it any less, I promise you that. So with that being said, we'll get started. Today we have a very special guest, Mr. Eddie Simmons. We'll be taking a look back in time and also talking about ways that we can positively impact the future of the sport. Mr. Eddie's very knowledgeable and has numerous accomplishments. He won the 1998 PKC World Hunt. He's won several Mississippi and Louisiana State Hunts, with the most recent being in 2012. You know, sometimes accomplishments aren't always about winning. At least I don't believe so in in this sport. His accomplishments go much deeper than that. By always ensuring to put God first and being an outstanding mentor to youth. So without further ado, Mr. Eddie Simmons, ladies and gentlemen. Today I have Mr. Eddie Simmons. How are you doing today, Mr. Eddie? Doing fine, buddy. Good to be here. Yes, sir. So if you don't mind, could you tell the folks a little bit about yourself? Sure. But first, I would like to say thank you for your effort to help keep this sport alive and well. Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate you being on here. It's folks like you being able to come on here that make this possible. So I appreciate it. It's just kind of, I was born and raised and lived here in South Mississippi all my life, about four miles off the Gulf. Uh, I was blessed to be raised by a mom and dad that loved me and provided for me. We were a conservative family. We raised farm animals and uh, we raised a garden summer and fall. We did both. My dad was a sheet metal mechanic. My mom was a stay-at-home, hard-working mother. Worked together. We hunted together, fished together, uh, played together, and we went to church together. As the years passed, I found myself work in construction more and more. And uh, one of my construction jobs wound up at DeLille, Mississippi, uh, building a DuPont plant. And uh, as that plant was completed, I was blessed and got hired by DuPont for maintenance. So I worked there for a pretty good while. And about four years into the uh, working for DuPont, I was truly blessed. Karen became my wife. We have shared this life together ever since. I managed to stay with DuPont about 32 plus years and then my knees and legs told me it was time to uh, step away from industrial maintenance. So I decided to uh, slow the pace down a little bit and I retired. I stayed retired for a short period of time and then I was blessed with the opportunity to go work for the professional kennel club. My job was a helper. Uh, I would help people know more about our sport and more about the Professional Kennel Club and uh, work with youngsters, which was my favorite part, working with the youth. As time went by quickly, it was time to slow the pace down again. So I moved on, and right now I find myself at 62 years old. Some days I just kind of look back and wonder, where did the time go? And then I also think... Uh, I can't let this pace get any slower because uh, most of my hunting buddies are much younger than me, and it's important to keep a steady pace now. I guess when I first started coon hunting, my dad come home one afternoon, and he said, uh, one of our friends that I work with has got a coon dog, and he's going to be hunting pretty close to home tonight. Would I like to go? So I had squirrel hunted and uh, rabbit hunted and deer hunted with my dad before but never coon hunting so uh, yes i wanted to go so as we ease out there and i get to listen to this dog track and tree with the voice he had and the style i knew i wanted to be a coon hunter so that was kind of the start of it and wasn't long after that we uh started a club the red creek coon hunters in uh Socia, and i got to be a part of that I was just a youngster, but I got to watch the older guys work, and we had club meetings and club hunts, and I really enjoyed the club hunts, and I would go along on some of the cast, and 
I guess the first cast I went on and watched uh, handlers and hounds work and compete, I knew at that point I wanted to be a competition hunter also. And uh, while we was in that club, uh, one of the gentlemen there, older gentlemen, me and him kind of bonded. He was a hard hunter. He was a dog man, and he was a competitor. He knew I wanted to learn, and uh, looking back, I knew he wanted to teach. And some of the things he used back then to help me, I think, will work today. He taught listen and listen some more. He said every dog's voice could tell you something, could communicate. Like if a dog is working a bad track, if a dog's working a medium track, or there's a coon right there at the end of his nose, he told me it was important to listen. And then after that, I advanced to listening for a dog to be in water, be in a cutover, uh, be in something just uh, real bad. And then uh, important locate and tree. He taught me all of that. I believe that would work today, starting with listen. Uh, back when me and him was hunting, my mom would allow me to hunt as many nights as I wanted to, except Sunday night. She had some simple rules. I've shared them before, and that was uh, just kind of knew the grades had to stay good in school. All my daily activities at home that I was responsible for had to be done. And then when she called me in the morning to get up and start my day, there was no arguing, no debate. It was immediately. And pretty simple rules, but they were very effective. Well, Man, that's awesome, Mr. Eddie. If, if you could, please tell me a little bit more about your time with the PKC. Well, when PKC started, uh, I guess Mr. Jarvis Humpers that owned PKC back then, he had sent out a letter to all the coon hunting clubs and invited everybody to come to the Paul B. Johnson State Park. He wanted to inform us about PKC, the strict rules, uh, the strict judging, the capabilities that a dog needed to win in PKC. And he also told us about a hunt coming to uh, Hattiesburg in 1984. It was going to be a large PKC hunt. It was going to have 192 dogs. Everybody was going to pay $250 entry fee. And then uh, you had to win four casts in a row, and the first place was going to be $6,000. Well, that was very interesting. And then when he got to talking about what kind of dog could win in PKC, he said if a dog could compete under the rules for two hours, use the rules strictly as written, and be even with the board, that dog could win in PKC. Well, on the way home, me and Basil, we decided that uh, we thought Old Bandit could do that. So fast forward a little bit, Bandit won the Winter Classic there at Hattiesburg, and I guess that was the beginning of mine and Basil's uh, long journey in PKC. Speaking of dogs that you've handled, you're talking about Bandit right there. You have handled and owned some great dogs. Do you have a favorite or maybe even a couple of favorites, and if so, why? Bandit, uh, a blue tick male that was a consistent winner. When the conditions got bad, that's when he got at his best. He was, he was a real good hound. And then there was Marge, an English female. She enjoyed tree and coons and was really good at it. Her strongest point was uh, if she open treed, trailed around and treed, or run a coon up hot. When she located, she treed the same every time. So that's what made her kind of special. Backing up on Bandit, he was a blue tick male. I forgot to say that. Yeah, you and old Marge won a pretty large hunt at one time, from what I've heard. Oh, yeah. We were we were blessed to uh, win the 98 PKC World Championship. Basil and Todd Fayard and myself owned her, and uh, it was just kind of a team effort. So that was probably 1990. That was probably 22 years ago. What are the difference between the dogs that you hunted 20 years ago versus the dogs that you're hunting now? Uh, my buddy Chico used to say, now this ain't like reading it out of the chapter of John, but my opinion is the rules have uh, changed our dogs as breeders now are breeding to fit the rules. As when I started, uh, there were hunts that would go three hours and uh, a dog could take as much time as he needed to finish a track and have a coon. And then later on in my years, uh, it went to two hours. Of course, that change the type of dog that would win in competition. The rules changed, the dogs had to change, and the breeders changed if they wanted to have winners. 
And now we're going to 90 minute cast and even an hour cast. And that means the rules has changed. The breeders will change and the dogs will change. Uh, what used to be a trailing dog would work. We're looking for a dog that'll take a, a, a warmer or hotter track and get that coon tree quick. Uh, but I tell you this, I believe that a dog that has the ability to tree a layup coon uh, would win 20 years ago, and that dog will still win today. You know, you hear people talk about old dogs all the time. Being that you've been involved in the sport so long, do you feel like we get caught up in the debtor is better? Uh, I do. I think human nature makes us want to defend the old favorite dogs we had, kind of recall the, uh, the nights they won, the nights they dominated, or the winning streak they went on, and we uh, have a tendency to uh, forget about those nights they look like they've never been before. Of course, you've hunted all over the United States. Do you have a favorite place that you've hunted, and if so, why? Well, one of my favorites is Illinois. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. You can find a cutover, you can find a beaver pond, or you can find a hill up there, but not very often. Most of the times you're hunting flatland, cornfields, river bottoms. I mean, it is beautiful up there. The number of coons, the coons live in Illinois. I mean, if you've got a dog that wants to tree coons, he can. A lot of times uh, we'll tree several coons on the cast and see several coons sitting up around us that my dog doesn't even know in this world. But uh, the right kind of dog can definitely win in Illinois. So you mean to tell me that you would rather hunt in a cornfield by a river bottom in Illinois than the DeSoto National Forest in, so in the pine thicket? Well, there ain't no place like home. But I'll tell you one thing. There's a little spot we laugh about over here on Highway 49. Called me one night, and I was hunting by myself, and it was August in there. And most of the time he said, are you having fun? Immediately I say, yep, having fun. But on this particular night, I'd walk about 10 minutes and have to rest and fall down. It's one of those places you can't touch the ground unless you make a real effort. I, I told him, I said, Johnny, I'm not real sure if I'm still having fun or not. But now, I've never experienced that in Illinois. I pretty much have I've been on some fun hunts up there. Yeah, I bet so. That's, that's pretty good. So, what was your most memorable cast you were ever a part of and why? Well, there's no need to uh, skip it, but it was the 1998 World Championship cast, and it was a blessing to be on it and a blessing to win it. But I've never forgot it. It kind of started out a little strange. We all come in there, and we did interviews. All the four handlers were going to do an interview, and the plan was each one of us to finish an interview and then go to the stop sign at the entrance to the park. Well, I was the last one that was going to do the interview. They wanted to know the strong points of your dog and uh, what you was hoping for in the final cast. So I roll up down there at the stop sign, blink my lights, and we're ready to roll. We have the judges, the guides, the handlers and dogs, and we go about an hour. And uh, this is the second round now, pretty late at night. So when we get stopped down there, as we're walking the dogs around, we decide, hey, we're missing a dog and a handler. Not good. We call back to the fairgrounds, and uh, we find our member there. Thankfully, the sheriff department uh, hustled him on down there with blue light escort. So that's put us back uh, another hour. You can call it late night or early morning, but uh, kind of a heck of a wait. So we cut loose. And now, remember, we didn't have garments or anything like that. And dogs have been gone about 20 minutes, I guess, before we had a bark. And uh, needless to say, your heart can pick up several times listening in the, the night, just wondering and waiting and listening. A garment sure would have come in handy. But anyhow, uh, moving along, after about 20 minutes, old Marge opens in there, struck, takes a very short track, and just rolls up tree. At that point, my heart was definitely uh, involved. And as we walk in there and the judge says, I've got him, things picked up again. So as we go on through the cast and make some more trees, I don't think I've ever looked at my watch as much or refigured scores as much as I refigured those. It was a good time. And on the way back to fairgrounds, I remember being 
just thanking God and thinking about my partners, my family, my friends, the miles, the years, and uh, it was my favorite cast. What was the purse difference back then versus now? Uh, well, the world championship has stayed at 30000 so it was 30000 to win it back in 98. That's a lot of money in 98. Yes, sir. A lot sir. of money in 2021. Yeah, absolutely. A whole lot of money in 98. But, you know, uh, I mean, now don't get me wrong. It was nice to win the money. But uh, when we went out there, it didn't have nothing to do with money. Ever since I was a boy, I had thought about and wanted to hopefully win a world championship. The money, and that's a true story, never entered my mind. And I'd say the same for the other handlers also. And that's how it really it should be. If you're if you're in coon hunting to make money, you're going to go broke quick. Uh, you're in the wrong sport. For sure. You need to take up something else. We were talking about the 1998 world hunt. You know, think back to that and... The equipment you used in that hunt, and now look at us today. Most of us are carrying around a thermal imaging device and tracking systems, GPSs. You know, we got an LED headlight, burns for 12 hours on bright. How much has technology changed the game of coon hunting? I would say a bunch because uh, as I come into coon hunting, the carbide light was done, as in people used to carry carbide and water. I'm no expert on that because I didn't get to use them. But we started with a Rayovac six volt battery and a headlight that we carried with us. And then we moved up to the motorcycle battery. A red alert there because most of your clothes you coon hunted in had acid stains on them. And then we moved up to the wheat light, which was an awesome light, durable, tough. And then around 1984, me and Basil, we bought our first big light bright light and spotlight that uh, really changed seeing the ground and and finding coons that was a a big deal for us and then uh, i'd say around 84 we bought our first uh, tracking system radio tracking system it just added so much safety for the dog knowing where the dog was and how to retrieve it i had a case made people kind of snickered but uh, i carried my tracker on my side with a antenna on my back and i left a collar in the truck and a collar on the dog pretty much at all times on a time out or end of the hunt i knew both the truck and the dog i enjoyed that part of it and then fast forward to the lights we got today uh they're just more compact brighter and everything like that and then this uh, garmin man it's changed the safety for dogs and safety for hunters so much shows their surroundings and uh, your surroundings and I'm all about safety for dogs and hunters. The heat seeker, that's amazing. Uh, it even works down south during the summer for us. There's a lot of coons that uh, we see with the heat seeker, but uh, we never get to see them by our eyes, and that's okay. The rules of PKC has also had to change with technology because the Garmin's made just for personal use in an event, no dog training or anything like that and the heat seeker there's a special time to use it so uh, they've changed our sport anything to make it safer and easier i'm all in yeah those are some huge changes mr eddie for sure but what are some of the other biggest changes that you can think about in your career in coon hunting that you've seen hunting territory is one that uh, we're experiencing uh, so much of our territory is disappearing and What amazes me is like uh, some of the clubs, hunting clubs, coon hunters are not welcome. I sure hate that because I I believe that uh, it's important for hunters to pull together. The words united we stand and divided we fall comes to my mind. And if there was any way for all hunters to be on one team, I believe it would benefit it, benefit us for the rest of our lives. Because of the hunting territory disappearing, we're having to drive further to hunt. That's a big change. But also, like uh, now, we got double headers in the hunts. PKC's got that part where you can hunt two times in one night. It helps hunters on expenses and everything like that. And that that's went over well and been kind of fun. The deal about now transmitting a cast live to people around the country watching it just like they're on that cast. That's pretty sharp right there. The amount of money that entry fees can be paid these days and the amount of money that a handler and an owner can win, that's just amazing. Uh, Some simpler things like dog boxes. When I was a boy, or it used to be nothing but wood dog boxes. It started to be with no divider, just everybody get in there and move around. 
And then finally, we went to dividers and wood dog boxes. And now today, that uh, it's about comfort and safety of the hound. That's That's been a big change I've seen. Something kind of simple, but uh, down here, if you happen to shine a light side the road night at night, used to, drivers would slow down and ease by. But things have changed for that also, as in you shine a light down here, most of the times they speed up. I don't know if that's around the country, but that's the way it is. What, what has not changed, and Landon can verify this, is uh, my log walking ability. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not changed any. And my enjoyment for a good pair of dry boots and a good dog on the end of my leash, that's still pretty big. Yeah, that is pretty awesome, man. Just think how far it's came. Such a short period of time. Can you even fathom, you know, back then that they would be hunting for a two hundred thousand dollar prize and stuff? I mean, that that's insane, right? It's amazing I mean, uh, where competition has came and thought of where it's going to go. As long as it stays where people's having fun, using sportsmanship, I think we're good to go. So you would figure with hunts like we were just talking about that it would affect the attendance. You know, you'd figure the attendance would be greater now, but what are your thoughts on attendance change throughout your coon hunting career in a competition hunt? Well, one of the changes I've seen is uh, there's more clubs having youth hunts and bringing our youth into it, and that has added to uh, the numbers. And then those youth, when they graduate from the youth program, uh, they're sticking with us. And then also the young ladies that's come into the youth program and sticking with us as coon hunters. And something else I've seen is a lot of these youngsters are bringing moms and dads and grandparents back to a sport they knew about and enjoyed. So you obviously hunted with some great dogs and against some great dogs, but out of all the famous hounds you've hunted with, which dog stands out the most in your mind and why? Uh, I'm going to go back a, a pretty good ways. Uh, when I was going to Mississippi State University, I had the opportunity to... Uh, hunt with and become friends with Mr. Pride Gann. He had won the ACHA World Champion with Gann's finisher, and he had won the 73 World Championship with Bean Blossom Buck. Buck was the dog. I got to hunt with him and Mr. Pride together, and old Buck was a good one. He uh, operated with authority, and he operated uh, a tree style that just kind of drew you in to want to watch him and want to turn him loose again. And then with Mr. Pride, with all the knowledge and hunting ability he had, I asked him no less than 100 questions a night. It just kind of put a drive in me to get to hunt with a world champion dog and a handler. And uh, it just brought me to another level of what I wanted to do. I remember the night I was walking down the road after our hunt. I told Mr. Pride, I said, I don't know if I'll ever own a world champion, but I've sure led one to the truck. You talking about Mr. Pride? That's one reason I want to start this podcast. You know, it's people like him. You know, don't you wish you could have went back and captured all of that? Oh, know? man, I really do. I remember one night that uh, me and Mr. Pride was hunting, and uh, he had a compass. It was a little green compass. He was standing there, and he throwed the little compass down, and he broke out a new one. I said, uh, what's the deal, Mr. Pride? He said, well, that's been a good compass. He said, I won the uh, 70 World Championship and 73 World Championship toting that compass. Hey, I picked that dude up pretty quick. I still got it home today. But Mr. Pride, he was, uh, he was a competitor. He was a gentleman. And uh, I enjoyed hunting with him and getting to meet him. People like that affect the sport, and they probably don't even know how they affected it. You know, down the road, it's 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 Absolutely. mind-boggling, honestly. You know, it's, Absolutely. It, yeah. And uh, that's a thing I think about uh, some of the conversations we get in and this carry ourselves. That there's people watching. Most of the time, it could be a youngster. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think we need to monitor ourselves real close on uh, the things we do and say. Yes, sir. I completely agree. It's sad when a kid can't even click on something on YouTube without you know, having to worry about it. I can promise you, if your kids are listening to this podcast, they don't have anything to worry about. But Mr. Pride, so are there any other people that you can think of that have been major influences in your coon hunting career? Oh, I mean, just hundreds of them. Uh, and I say that some of my best friends are going on to heaven now. Mr. Chico Yates from Mobile, Alabama, and Basil Cattell from Ocean Springs, Mississippi. My buddies like Craig DeChamp and Roger Dale Carnegie, we, uh, we kind of started way back together, and uh, we just en- enjoyed this sport. I'm sure that 
just the type of person you are. We don't we don't have enough time on this podcast for you to name everybody that you've been influenced by and you have influenced. You know, let's don't forget about that. I'm I'm sure that there's people sitting around that you don't even know about that are saying, you know, yeah, Mr. Eddie Simmons, he really helped me along the way. You know, even though you don't, you might not even know it. And thank you for that for sure. Well, I appreciate it, but I I would like to say something else. Like my buddy Richard Owens, when I went to Mississippi State, I had met him at the uh, Dixie National probably around 75, and I told him that I was planning on coming to Mississippi State uh, when I graduated from high school, and he gave me his number right then. He said, when you get up here, give me a call. We'll go hunting. First week I was at Mississippi State, I called my buddy Richard Owens. From there, we hit it off also. He took me to my first world championship. Uh, he took me to my first Little World Championship and uh, let me hunt a dog. We had some good times together. If you've ever heard of the Silver Dollar Dog, Silver Dollar Flip and Cracker and Crockett, that's who Richard was. And just back in memory, a dog Richard had, Silver Dollar Flip, uh, I remember a big highlight that me and Richard had. And we placed him in the Little World Hunt, the Grand American, and the World Hunt all in the same year. And for us, uh placing in all those ACHA hunts in one year. Now, we didn't win them, but it, we had a lot of fun going to them. Yeah, that is definitely, definitely cool to hear about. And I'm, I'm kind of a, I guess, a nerd when it comes to all that. I love to hear about the old stuff. And, you know, it's still so relevant today. That's what makes it so special to me, I, I think, at least. But, you know, speaking of some not old stuff, I've, I've seen some photos of you on Pro Hound handing trophies to the winners of the Youth World Hunt. How special was that to you? Uh, that was a highlight for me. Uh, I love working with kids and hearing their stories and meeting their families and things like that. And I'd like to say right here, if a youngster happens to be listening, if there's an opportunity to you to get involved with the PKC Youth Program, please do. It's an awesome program for youngsters. It's for and about youngsters. Uh, the group of people that's involved is awesome. Uh, try to get to the youth program. Try to make it to a qualifying where you can win your $100 and go to the PKC Youth World Championship. Your family and you will enjoy it. It will remain in your memory. So speaking of successful youth hunts that they can win their $100 at, I know that you're a huge part of a very successful youth hunt slash fun day, and it's also the Mississippi State Championship, Youth State Championship in Wiggins, Mississippi every year. So can you tell me about all the events y'all have down there and the hunt and what all goes into that? Yes, we. Uh, first I'd like to say we have been blessed. Good Lord willing, this will be our ninth year to uh, be doing uh, the Youth Fun Day and night hunt and it is an entire team of uh people that uh, work hard to make this happen but i guarantee you we enjoy it as much as the youngsters that get to come uh we have a drag race tree and contest bench show squalling contest we have uh all kind of events for the kids uh, we have many giveaways that throughout the day it may be a hula hoop it may be a bottle holder or anything like that for the giveaways but uh, the event winners they uh, will range from gift certificates uh, dog boxes uh, folding benches we try our best to uh, do good in the awards for these kids and uh, there's no entry fee for day events there's no charge for food we uh, we feed our kids and uh, we just hope they come and have a good t- day, a fun day, and learn a little bit about our sport. Hopefully hear something there that will help them throughout life. And uh, we share the gospel with them. We tell them about God and his love. Uh, Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks have been a tremendous support of our team. Uh, they help us financially with their uh, youth program. They send or allow to come Mr. Steve Parham that loves his job and loves to work with kids. He brings us uh, much information about what's going on in Mississippi. Gun safety, water safety, Mr. Steve covers it all. The kids really enjoy his part. So he's been part of our team for a long time. And uh, like I said, we feed the kids dinner and supper, and uh, we have a little little downtime, but not much. We're, we stay pretty busy. And I just want to go back to the people that help us. We're a team. Uh, it takes people taking entries, signing people up, hunt directors. It, it takes everybody. It's a blessing. 
Well, and then when dark comes, we start the uh, PKC Mississippi State Youth Championship. Now, there is a $30 entry fee for that. The prizes are really great also. Each uh, youngster that gets in the final four gets a new dog box. Uh, everybody that wins a cast automatically gets $100. But if you're in the final four, you get a new dog box. For every other cast winner, along with their $100, they get a gift certificate. Uh, the winner of the event also is qualified for the national championship, which is a, a big PKC hunt. Every youngster that wins a cast is qualified for the PKC Youth World Hunt. I'm going to tell you, that uh, when you see our advertisement come out, please make every effort to bring a child or bring a youngster or we have no age limits. Just come be a part of our day and night hunt. So being that all the fun day activities and all the food is free for all the youth involved, y'all give away all these great prizes and, and you have this nice purse. The stores and companies must give you all that food and everything for free, right? <laughs> no, but uh, I want to tell you, we are blessed to have sponsors. We have fundraisers. We sell raffle tickets on hunting equipment, whether lights and uh, collars and garments. And so we give an effort, uh, a pretty good effort, along with people that just help us to raise this money. It's uh, something we work on throughout the year. Been very blessed. Let's say someone listening to this would like to make a monetary donation, or maybe they own a business and they want to donate you know, sponsor it, and or maybe they just want to help out. How would they go about doing that? Well, uh, they could contact me or uh, Johnny uh, or Chance or any club member, any team member. Uh, they definitely would would be appreciated to be part of our team. We we welcome anybody that wants to be part of our team. Yeah, and you can message the Coon Hunting University podcast Facebook page, and I can put you in contact with these guys pretty easily if you would like to do what we just talked about. So what tips would you give to a club thinking about putting on an event like y'all host here in Wiggins? Some of the bridges we crossed when we uh, first got started is, uh, it's a bad word, but it occurs, is fear. We were uh, not sure that we had enough people and if we could have a hunt like this, we had talked about it and was concerned. And our president and good friend, Johnny Payroll, after a meeting, he said, we've got friends, we can do this. And uh, there's something about spoken words. I already knew we had friends, but when Johnny said it out loud, uh, it just kind of kicked in. We started calling people in state, out of state, local clubs, uh, family and friends that really headed us down the right road. And I would suggest for anyone wanting to start one of these uh, youth events, remember, you got friends. If you need help, say you need help, call them, ask for help. You always have to have someone to lean on. You know, it's, it is a team effort. And no matter how much you cannot do it all yourself. Like Chance was talking about last week, you know, that's how, if you want to start a club, that's one thing you need to do. You need to have a team. Absolutely. Uh, another thing we face that your team may face is uh, – we had had some big numbers. Uh, like I said, now we're thankful, but uh, at one time we had hunted over 60 kids. We signed up over 100, and even just like in the treeing contest, we had 80. Well, we faced a year where our numbers uh, were down. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing, but I got a little hung up on numbers. And one of our team members uh, told me something I've never forgot. Uh, Seth, he said, Ed, uh, God's word says, feed my sheep. It doesn't say anything about counting them. And uh, let's feed the ones we got and make sure they have the best day they can have. And uh, so my thoughts on that would be if you hit a slow spell or it starts out slow, don't count them. Feed them. I believe you'll be preparing for next year pretty quickly. That's true words. True words for sure. What do you feel like are some things that the average Joe houndsman like myself can do to positive impact on the sport and to ensure to preserve this way of life? Uh, I don't like the words average because uh, I'm a firm believer if you're a coon hunter or you enjoy the sport, there's a place for you. I know that uh, anybody that wants to become part of our team or, or in coon hunting, there's a place. Uh, we need people that will guide, maybe judge, take entries, maybe be on a committee for us, maybe send out a letter uh, once a month to club members, uh, hunt directors, 
uh, there's a place for everybody, and there's no person that's uh, not welcome. And all you got to do is find your spot. And I feel that way in our sport also. You know, you hadn't got to hunt every night, or maybe you're really not, uh, you want to be the cook. There's a place for you. There's always a place for the cook. I can promise you that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Mr. Eddie, what do you feel like has been the most heartfelt achievement in all your years? There's there's several of them, and uh, and I say this humbly, but like being part of the Wiggins team with our Youth Fund Day, uh, that's that's definitely on the list. I've been blessed to speak to the youth at the Youth World Championship. That that was kind of uh, touching on my heart, being a co-owner of a world champion, being there when Craig and Roger Dale won the world championship, earning over a hundred thousand dollars in PKC. That was a goal I'd kind of set. Uh, I got to lead an opening prayer at the world championship. That was uh, touching for me. Partnership dog that won a youth world championship for a youngster. That was uh, very heart touching. Uh, being inducted into the PKC Hall of Fame, being partnership with uh, Knight. He was the first blue tick, became a gold champion. And I guess the just touched by the so many friendships I've been allowed through the years in this sport. And uh, looking back, I am truly thankful for the day that my dad introduced me to coon hunting and the day Mr. Jarvis Umpers introduced me to the PKC family. So uh, my time, uh, I guess, is limited because I didn't mess around and got to be 62 years old. I've had a big time. You know, a person can only hope to have that many moments in a sport. Most people would set a goal for a quarter of those things. You know, I mean, you can't even expect. I mean, you've achieved so much throughout your career. I believe we can learn a lot from you as a well, houndsman and as the way you carry yourself as well. You know, it's not always about winning. It's really not. And like you said, it's not always about the money. It's not. Uh, uh, I'd like I'd like to say something else, too. It's uh, uh, everything there. Uh, most of the achievements I've had with a dog, I have uh, either been hunting someone else's dog or been partners with somebody. And uh, that, to me, uh, of being partners with people, I enjoy that. Hunting friends as dogs, I enjoy that. So I really hadn't done much by myself, pretty much nothing. But with uh, the blessing of the friends and uh, partners I've had and people that's allowed me to be a part, just thankful. I really, really do appreciate you coming on here, spreading your words, letting people hear your story. It, it was great. And I, I do plan on having you back on here prior to the Youth State Championship in March. I would like to get back together and we can do it and you know do another episode and maybe cover some more things because there's just so much. I mean, you can't cover it all in time. Do you have anything else you'd like to say before we sign off? Yes, sir. Uh, I sure do. If anybody's out there listening, that I'd like to remind them that always remember that God loves us. The God that created the heavens, the earth, and this universe. Almighty God, we're his most proud possessions, each one of us, and he loves us. And please remember that Jesus is Christ, his son, died for all our sins and offers salvation to anyone that will uh, want it from him. Seek him. And Tyler, I thank you for this day. I've sure enjoyed it. And thank you for landing and Chance and you being here and the fun we've had. And uh, this was a real good experience for me. And I appreciate it. Yes, sir. We thank you, Mr. Eddie. Thank you all for listening. Please do not forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram at Coon Hunting You. And y'all don't be playing hooky now. Have a wonderful day.